Daniel mentioned to me this morning that we need to, and I'd like to have a season of prayer about this actually because uh, uh, I did not hear this news. I hadn't gotten it, but um, uh, the guy in North Korea, the dictator there, the communist leader in North Korea, I guess this past week had found a, a group of 30 Christians who had, uh, had been planting underground churches and uh, his, uh, that's what they had been doing, these groups. And, and I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I said, yeah, I did say that right. And in the last several years, they had planted over 150 underground churches. But these Christians were found out, and Daniel was telling this morning, they're, they're scheduled to be put to death this morning in North Korea, these Christians are. Of course, something like that's not going to make the, the morning news, and no one's going to talk about it here. But we forget, folks, that all around our country, uh, you know, we, we complain that we lost an hour of sleep, you know, and, uh, you know, underground churches a lot of times will meet at night, okay? Uh, underground churches don't have starting times because if they all arrive at the same time, then they'll pick up on it and find them. So sometimes people will get to church one and two hours before everybody else gets there so it won't look like everybody's arriving at the same time. And, uh, you know, we, we forget that stuff in America. We forget that we're, um, you know, we, we don't have it so bad, okay? Uh, yeah, it's a little hot in here. We can fix the temperature, you know? Uh, there, they, they don't use lights many times in those underground churches because if they use lights, they'll be found out. So uh, I'd like to just, uh, this moment, you know, I, I told Daniel after he told me that, I said, you know, that guy better watch out over there. This is what starts revivals, you know. <laughs> uh, first century church, they were persecuted, and people said, wow, if they're willing to die for their faith, that must really be the real deal. And that, that saw a great revival in the first century. So uh, we just need to pray for these folks, pray for their families, and uh, pray that God uses it for His glory and for His honor. Pray that um, well, maybe this will be... Wouldn't it be pretty awesome if there was a revival breakout in North Korea, you know, and uh, they could tear down that stupid, uh, or get rid of that stupid demilitarized zone that they've got there. And I've been to Korea, I've seen that. It's it, it's tragic, you know. It's a sad, sad situation, and uh, for the Korean people, let's have a word of prayer together. Father, we uh, as we come to this service this morning, we we come here, we sit in padded chairs, we, we all have Bibles, and, and we uh, have, have access to instruments and electricity, and, and um, Lord, we, um, most of us probably stayed up too late last night and got more sleep than the average person still does in many other countries, and Lord, I know we're weary and we're tired, but Lord, it's nothing compared to what these folks have been called to do. I... Um, as you've called them to make the ultimate sacrifice, and Lord, barring some miracle, some uh, uh, intervening somehow, uh, it, it sounds as if these, these people will be martyrs for the faith of Jesus Christ. Something we don't see in our country is something we can't really relate to. We've read stories about it, but God, it, it's so far removed from us that we, we get so comfortable in, in, in what we do here. And Lord, we forget, I, Lord, the, if they've started 150 churches around this country, what, a, what an incredible group of faithful people. This morning, I want to lift them up in prayer. I want to lift up their families in prayer. I don't have a timetable. I don't know when this execution is supposed to be take place. I pray for their families, though, um, who will probably also be under some persecution. Um, Lord, I pray for the government of North Korea that somehow maybe these persecutions might be stayed. And um, Lord, also just uh, pray that... Um, uh, that your mighty work would take place there no matter what happens. And maybe others, by seeing their commitment and their faith in Jesus Christ, will, will realize that something worth dying for is also something worth living for. And uh, so I pray that you'd empower them in a special way this morning, in, in a way that uh, uh, has never been seen there. And Lord, also, just God, I know you can bring a revival. If you can bring a revival to Nineveh, the days of... of uh, of Jonah, uh, a heathen nation like that, God, I know you can do it again in, in a country like North Korea. So, Father, I ask that your your hand be upon that country and that, those families. Lord, I think of the airplane that um, those many people that are on that this morning still, as, as we left home this morning, still have not been found. No one's heard anything. Pray for uh, uh, the situation in, in Ukraine and Russia. Pray for the situation in Argentina that we heard about this morning. Lord, it just seems like there's so much unrest. I'm so thankful that we stand upon the rock of ages, the, the uh, rock of salvation, Jesus Christ. 
May we plant our feet firmly there, and knowing that no matter what comes, no matter what storms of life come, Lord, you, you, can, you can keep us strong as we stand in your strength. The Lord really, truly is our strength. Um, just as you were with uh, Daniel in that lion's den and Paul and Silas in that jail, or just as you defeat Satan, um, you are our strength this morning. May we trust and rely on you in all things. Um, God, we just commit this service into your hands, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to pray for uh, Sheila's sister, no, niece, I'm sorry, your niece who fell this week. Um, roller skating with some boys and just pretty much destroyed the bottom part of a leg, what Sheila was telling me there. Uh, broke several bones. Uh, Let's let's pray for her. keep her in your prayers too. All right, let's uh, let's read some interesting comments made by Jesus. Uh, kind of a controversial passage of scripture, not controversial, but a lot of scholars have debated this this situation here. Um, Mark chapter three verse thirty one says, "Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside." By the way, I'm sorry. I guess I shouldn't interrupt the scripture for this. It just popped in my head. Don't forget our business meeting right after church this morning. Okay. <laughs> That's it. Moving on. Back to verse 31. Then his brothers and his mother came, standing outside. They sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brother are outside seeking you. But he answered, saying, Who is my mother? Or who is my brother? Or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat around him, about him, and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whosoever does the will of my God is my brother and my sister and my mother." Real quick, let's recap um, uh, kind of what's going on here. You remember last week I said this was kind of part two of last week's message, and, and it will be. Um, a crowd has gathered in Capernaum, a crowd, again, that is so large that Jesus and his disciples can't even eat. We learned that last week. Uh, people are coming from all around to be healed. The demon-possessed are large and boisterous. The scribes and Pharisees are there. Every movie makes watching him, making sure that he doesn't do something wrong. They're trying to catch him in any trap that they can. Now his family has come down to Capernaum. Uh, his brothers, possibly some of his uh, family friends. And we learned last week they came for the purpose of intervening. Okay, They came for the purpose of, of actually trying to snatch Jesus away and get him to a, a safer place. And they believed because, verse 21 told us, because he's out of his mind. Okay, They thought, now remember, this is Mary, mother of Jesus, who wrapped him in swaddling clothes while the cattle were lowing and all that stuff that we sing about at Christmas time. This is that same Mary who, with her, with her sons, other sons, and, and maybe some friends, have said, you know, we got to go get Jesus. <laughs> he is really riling some things up. We don't know what's going on. He's probably not eating well. Doesn't sound like, you know, sound like he's under a lot of pressure. And by golly, we need to save this guy. And besides that, we, he's saying some crazy stuff here, okay? Like, you know, he's the son of God and stuff like that, you know. And we know he is, but, you know, maybe we shouldn't be publicizing that, okay? And they say in verse 21, he's out of his mind. Well, his family, when they get there, they, they can't get to him because they've got the same problem that everybody else has had. Okay? There's a big crowd. And they show up, and, and they're in the back of the crowd. They're standing outside. And I don't know how it got started. Maybe somebody wrote a note on a piece of paper, or more, maybe they just tapped them on the shoulder, and they said, Hey, listen, can you get word to Jesus? Pass it on. You know, pass it down. Get word to Jesus. We're here to see him. Let him know that his brothers and his mother are standing outside. Okay? And we... we, we we kind of know what should have happened here, I guess, in our mind's eye, right? I mean, most of us, if this were to happen to us, we know that somebody's here to see us, okay? Then, uh, you know, we get a note. Um, we expect the scene to kind of go like this. You know, Jesus gets the note or gets word, and somebody whispers in his ear, your mom and your brothers are here. We expect Jesus to kind of go, oh, really? Well, hey, th that's great. Uh, Y'all excuse me for just a few minutes. I'm going to go outside. My mom's here. My brothers are here. I haven't seen him in a while. I'm going to take 15 minutes to go out and talk to him. You know, I haven't had a chance to eat lunch anyway, so we may go down to the local McDonald's and grab a bite to eat, you know, and we'll, uh, uh, I'll be back. You disciples, you carry on till I get back, and, and everything's going to be good. Right? Now, that's what we expect. That's what we expect, right? Jesus to give honor to his mom and his, and his, and his brothers. But no one was really prepared for his response. Jesus says, who's my mother? Uh, Jesus have a case of amnesia here all of a second, or what? You know, all of a sudden, he just all of a sudden, mother, mother, who, who, who gave me birth? Uh, I, I can't remember that. Uh, who, who's my brothers? 
Now, you know, so there's been times I'd like to forget my brothers, okay, but, but uh, I still know who they are, kind of pretty much know where they live, and I know their names. I know my brothers, all right? He says, right here are my mother and brothers, those who do the will of my father. They are my brothers, my sisters, my mother. Now, I'll be honest with you. When you read a passage of Scripture like this, your first thought is, what is this all about? What is going on? Uh, in fact, I'm just guessing some of you kind of struggle with this passage also. And maybe you've read it as a kid, you've read through it many years, and you're saying, you know, and, and as we read it again, it kind of came back to your thinking, well, what just is he doing here? Why doesn't he go out and greet them? Why doesn't he? And by the way, the Scripture never says that, that he actually went out later and hung out with them, okay? There's no indication of that. And some of you may be sitting here going, well, how rude, you know, <laughs> can't believe Jesus would, would refer to his mother and his brothers that way. I mean, they're family. So what's going on here? Now, I will tell you this. In that culture, this would have seemed not only rude, but downright disrespectful, uh, uh, rude heightened here. Okay, In the Jewish culture, family was everything. All right, uh, Here was Mary, this again, this woman who had nursed him, loved him, held him, and, and raised him, uh, gave him birth. She, he was very precious to her. And, and I don't know about you, how would you feel if you travel distance, several days, maybe possibly even seven weeks, to go see your son, and you go to see him, and the word gets to him, hey, your, your mother's here, and uh, your son says, mother, these people are my mother. Now, come on, you moms, how would you feel about that? A little bit ticked? A little bit angry? Okay, you know what it's like when you call your kids on the phone and say, hey, this is your mom. They say, hey, mom, good to hear you, but you know, I'm really busy right now. Can you call back later? You know, you know, called Rick the other day. Hey, I got a soccer game, and I got a this game, and I got a that game. Can we call? Can I call you after the games? When will those end? Well, like next Thursday. You know, so you know, like, well, how rude. Okay, you know, or you dads. You know, I've done this with my son. Hey, I'm gonna take off a day and come down and see you. They're like, ah, you know, dad, it might not be a good idea. <laughs> well, we talked about it. it might not be a good idea. I'm your dad. If I call and I want to say I come down, you should drop everything and have some time for me. Yeah, well, dad, you know, just a little busy. And then I'll start singing a song. Oh, the cat's in the cradle in the silver spoon. Okay, you know, that, you know, when you're coming home, son, I don't know when, Dad. You know, and I get all teary-eyed and I go, well, that turkey, okay? You know, how rude can you be? All right? Sorry, I slipped back to the 60s there for just a moment. All right? You know, you're going to feel angry here. You're going to be a little bit crushed. Might just be a little hurt, okay? In fact, some biblical critics have accused Jesus of actually sin here. In fact, one skeptic named Renan said, Jesus is trampling underfoot everything that is human, love and blood and country. That's a pretty strong accusation to say that Jesus actually sinned at this point. Now, did Jesus sin here? No, of course not. He didn't sin. So what did happen? Good answer, Elijah. You got that one right. All right. You get an A for the day. All right. So what was he doing? What was he saying? What was he teaching? Well, first of all, the thing you need to understand was here is that Jesus was not severing family ties, okay? How do we know that? Well, first of all, at the cross, okay? At the cross, we see Jesus' loving, kind words as he made provision for his mother. Uh, Jesus wasn't saying, Mary, leave me alone, and I never want to talk to you again, okay? He wasn't saying that. Later on, his brother James would become a devoted follower, a devoted follower and martyr. His brother Jude, who, who most likely wrote the book of Jude, many scholars agree, followed him fully. So Jesus was not saying, listen, now that I've started my public ministry, I can't have anything to do with my family. Um, he wasn't saying that we're to leave our family behind to follow Christ or that you can never have contact with them again. By the way, there are some religions who teach that, that once you get involved in their religion, you can't ever have contact with your family again. In Mark chapter 7, and I was going to take the time to go study this, but I don't think I will, but, but in Mark chapter 7, an interesting passage of Scripture, Jesus actually blasts the Pharisees for not honoring the fifth commandment, uh, which is honor your father and mother. They had written laws to get around that commitment. In fact, uh, uh, Jewish custom was that, that when parents got old, the children would take care of them. Okay? Now, that's a little foreign for us nowadays. Uh, a lot of people say, no, when they get old, you put them in a nursing home, okay? And you let somebody else take care of them, okay? But, but in Hebrew culture, it was always common that when the parents got old, they couldn't take care of themselves, that the children took care of them, okay? That's just kind of the way it was supposed to done, be done. And a lot of cultures still do that, and some of you understand that. But, uh, but the, the, the Pharisees had given a law that allowed the people to say, well, you know, actually because I'm so committed to God, I don't have time to serve my parents, 
Okay? And because I've made this commitment to God, then that commitment is more important than my commitment to my parents, and so therefore I don't have to take care of my parents. And they'd allow this law to creep into the Old Testament law. And Jesus blasts them for that. Okay? And kind of says, you know, you're just taking the law, writing it however you want to, and making it say whatever you want to, just so you can, you can get out of it. What Jesus meant in this passage is simply this, and that is that there is a much deeper kinship than flesh and blood. A much deeper kinship than flesh and blood. You see, when two people obey the Father and work together to do His will, there becomes a kinship. This is actually even stronger than the kinship that we have in our own physical families. Um, how many of you here have family members who just don't quite get why you go to church every Sunday and why you're so committed to Christ and why you do that church thing all the time? You know, have you got family members that just think that you're a little bit weird doing it? Okay. Or how many of you have family members that, you know, when I sit down and talk to them about spiritual things or talk to them about the Bible, they just kind of look at me like, I don't get it. Anybody like got a few family members like that? You know, they're like, what's the point? What's the purpose? Why do you do that? You mean you go to church every Sunday? I mean, you read that Bible every day? Man, that's just a little weird, okay? And, and, and you know, even if you come from a family of Christian people, okay, uh, I know when Brenda and I decided we are going to go in the ministry and go to Bible college and those kinds of things, people were kind of like, well, you know, that's kind of cool, but isn't that a little bit overboard? I mean, that's like the rest of your life thing, you know? Uh, what are you going to do for a living? You know, how are you going to eat? You know, that kind of stuff. You know? And we'd get those kinds of questions. Um, and Jesus is saying here, listen, if you pair up two people who have committed their lives to obey the Father and they begin to work together to do His will, which is what happens in a church, He says there is a kinship that is even stronger than our own families. When a person comes to Christ, they now belong to a family that is far superior to a human family. It has stronger ties. It is more satisfying. It is much more demanding. And what Christ was saying is that those in his spiritual family were far more dear to him than even his human family. You've got to remember, his brothers here at this time pretty much had kind of, remember they'd written him off as a kook already, and, and they really weren't followers of him. The Bible says they didn't become really believers until after Jesus died and his resurrection and all that. And, and you can see how that would change their opinion. But at this point, they really didn't follow him. And so he hung out with those and he stayed with those and brought in those into his spiritual family who, who followed and believed in him. It is very important to understand what he is saying here because what he is saying has some very powerful implications upon the, not only the church but also on the home. Let's talk about this a little bit. What are the implications of Jesus' statement for the church? I mean, if Jesus says that, that our spiritual family ha, ha, is actually a deeper kinship than even our physical family, well, what does that mean for us here in this body of believers? Jesus said in John 4, 34, earlier in his ministry, he said, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. In other words, obedience to the Father was what sustained him and kept him going. And everything about the life and ministry of Jesus was about doing the Father's will. And what you want you to catch in all of this is that obedience, let me say that again, write that down somewhere because I don't think I put it in your outline obedience is the thing that ties the families together. Let me say it again. Obedience is the thing that ties and, and bonds this kinship. Now, when we think about a physical rela our family relationship, this makes total sense, doesn't it? All right? Because we have all lived out this scene at one time or another. All right? This scene has been played out in homes across America. The family is having a nice family time together, Right? Dad is reading the newspaper while watching ESPN. Men can multitask, by the way. Okay, uh, they can read the sports page and watch ESP, EP, EP, that show ESPN at the same time. Okay, now they can't do a third thing and listen to their wife all at the same time, but that's beside the point. All right, see, so ladies, you should know that. All right, so Dad's reading the newspaper. Mom and the kids, they're 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 on the floor. They're playing a board game. It's little Johnny's turn. Little Johnny rolls the dice, picks up his piece. Tink, 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 tink. While he's going, passes the little puppy dog piece that's his little sister's, knocks it with his piece, and goes, tink, 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 tink. sorry. Okay, you yeah. know, says something like that. All right. And little sister says, he knocked over my puppy dog piece. All right. 
And he says, so what? It's stupid. Dogs are stupid, and you're stupid for liking dogs anyway. Except if you're in the Jones household and you can't say stupid. Okay. Uh, truth is, you know, and truth is, Big Brother wanted to be the puppy dog all along. But he didn't get to be the puppy dog this time because Sister beat him to the puppy dog piece, and so he didn't get to be the puppy dog. So he was mad to start the game anyway. And then she says, he called me stupid. Okay. And... Finally, there's a fight that breaks out, and they're pushing, they're shoving, they're, they're getting mad. Finally, the wife looks at the husband and screams, Honey, would you do something with these kids? Because he's still reading the newspaper, okay? He, he knows what's going on. He just would much rather read the newspaper, okay? And so finally, you know, the, the, you know somebody marches little Johnny upstairs, either the mom or dad, uh, applies the Board of Education, um, which you know this is an old illustration, uh, and the entire scene, you know, uh, 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 serene harmony of the home has been wrecked because of what? Disobedience, right? Disobedience. And even when it's all done, and the smoke is cleared, and little Johnny has come back downstairs, and he has wiped his tears, Dad's not happy because he wanted a nice, peaceful time at home tonight, right? He wanted to watch his ball game and read his newspaper. Mom's not happy because all she wants is a loving home where there's peace and harmony. Little sister's not happy because she doesn't get to play her game. Little Johnny's not happy because, of course, you know. And little sister, by the way, she's feeling also a little bit guilty because she knows she could have let all that go, and she irked it on too. And all that time it felt, you know, even to her, it kind of felt good that Big Brother's in trouble. Little Johnny's not happy because he's in rebellion. He thinks he's misunderstood by the whole family. Life is unfair. He's considering running away and joining the circus, right? The point is, folks, it was a whole lot better when there was obedience in the home. When there was obedience and everyone was cooperating and everybody was working together and things were gelling, it was a whole lot better. I've heard parents say this sometimes. You have too. I don't know who those kids are. I don't know whose kids those are, right? I don't know what family they belong to, right? And what happens when they disobey? What's the first thing we want to do? Disown them. Right? Get them out of the family, all right? I don't know who those kids are. Uh, preachers do this. You know, preachers' kids. I don't know. I ain't, I'm not a preacher here. You know, they're my kids. You know, you know. It's just you know, disown them because you don't want them to be united with your family. Because, folks, obedience brings harmony and unity and cohesiveness and joy and accomplishment and peace, and it binds families close together. And listen, if it's that way in the human family, is it not even so much more in our Christian family? You see, this is what happens all the time when. A group of people get together from Kansas City and they pack up some vans and they pack up some trucks and they truck and they head on south and they swing through Texas and they pick up a group of people from Texas and they jump in the vehicle and they they caravan down. They go down to Mexico and they start to build a building and they start to do some kind of a ministry project or build a church and nobody can talk and nobody can communicate because people in Kansas City talk totally different people in Texas anyway. And people in Texas, you know, they get to Mexico and nobody can communicate there because they're all speaking different languages. And when they get done at the end of the week or at the end of two weeks and they built this project they all stand around what they do they hug and they cry and they hold on and say, we love you so much you know and they go home and they've got this bond and this unity because they you know they're writing letters for months back and forth to people in texas and people in, in mexico and the people translating why because of the unity and the harmony of obe- obeying god's will and, and working and together in cohesiveness it's a bond like it happens every year at youth camp Every year at youth camp, kids go off to camp, they come back, they meet up with kids from 15 other different churches from Oklahoma and Texas and Kansas and Missouri and Arkansas and all these places, and they get together there, and by the end of the week, they're lifelong friends. Some of them are lifelong boyfriends and girlfriends, at least for a week, anyway, you know? And so, uh, you know, but they just, they, they have fallen in love with one another because they've met other Christians who have the same goals and purpose and ideas that they have for serving God. And it's a beautiful thing. We love it. And youth directors standing around going, come on, we've got to get in the van. And nobody wants to go home. Nobody wants to go home. You know why? Because for a week, they've, some of them, be the, it's the first family they've ever felt in their life. And they know they're going to go back to this home of mess and yuck and crud and screaming and hollering and whatnot. And because that's all they know what family is all about. And Jesus is saying, when we work together in obedience to God's will, it builds a kinship that is, is incredible, almost impo- it's, it is impossible to break. And of course, the reverse of that is also true. A church family is close, but then disobedience enters the picture. And when one person or family is pulling away and they don't want to come around much, and you can't figure out what's going on, a lot of times there's disobedience to God's will somewhere. 
And in fact, they feel more comfortable hanging around those in, in Satan's family because of disobedience in their own life. Jesus' statement calls us to obedience together in the family of God. And Jesus later says in this book, in fact, just turn over a few pages to Mark chapter 10, look at verse 29 and 30. I think this statement, it's kind of along the same lines, but it's almost, uh, almost um, uh, stronger. In Mark 10, verse 29 and 30, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. And they'll receive houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands. I love how he throws this in. Oh, yeah, and by the way, with some persecutions. In the age to come, eternal life. Um, say, Brother Jeff, what's that mean? How in the world am I going to get a hundredfold when it comes to mothers, brothers, sisters? And well, because I grew up in a home that had three sisters. I grew up in a home that had two brothers. Okay? You know how many brothers I've got in this room? A whole lot more than three. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. I got 14 brothers in this room. I'm going to tell you something else. They all treat me a whole lot better than my other brothers do. <laughs> These brothers call me. Uh, these brothers will pray for me. Uh, these brothers will love on me. Uh, these brothers will come together every Sunday night and we'll pray together for, for things that are burdening us. To be quite honest, I'm probably closer to you folks, a whole lot closer to you than I am to my own physical brothers. If I've got a real need and I really need something really bad, I won't pick up the phone and call my brother. I, I, I might call one of you guys, though. When I want to go to lunch, I usually call one of you brothers, okay? And in this room, i got a mess of sisters. You know, i got a whole lot more sisters here. i only got three in my family. And, and to be quite honest, I'm a lot closer to you than I probably am even my sisters because I spend time with you guys, and I hang out with you guys, and, and I love you guys. But what really makes it work together is obedience to the will of God working and serving together here in this ministry. That's what, that's, what brings, that's what brings the family kinship that we have. And what's so cool about this kinship is we can come from different parts of the world, parts of different the country, and, and hook up with people obeying God and serving Him, and, and, and we jump right in, we obey God and serve Him, and we get a kinship that's, that, that's, that lasts a lifetime. Um, when uh, Myrna, and I don't want to embarrass Myrna, but uh, when Myrna and I worked at, uh, but I'm going to anyway. Yeah, so uh, when Myrna and I worked at uh, uh, Target together, and, uh, and I found out she was a Christian, and she found out I was a Christian, I mean, just immediately, we had this, this brother-sister bond, and we talked, and, and we began to share things about God, and, and, and she would ask me to pray for her, and I'd ask her to pray for me, and, and, and just all of a sudden, we, we had this brother-sister in Christ thing. And, and where are you from originally, Myrna? Honduras. You know how many people I know in Honduras? Zero. Okay. But I mean, she, came, she moved up all the way here from Honduras just to meet me and, <laughs> and have this sweet fellowship with me because she knew there's other Christian people there. And you know what? Yeah, yeah, our, our backgrounds are so different. I mean, I'm a local yokel city kid who grew up in Independence, Missouri, and she grew up in Honduras. I can hardly spell Honduras. And yet we've got a common bond in Jesus Christ because we obey the Father and, and we're just, just serving together. And then Daniel moves from all places up here from Alabama. I mean, come on, give me a break. Are there really Christians in Alabama? You know? And he's told me about lots of people in Alabama who are Christians. He's got parents who are Christians there. And there's really churches in Alabama. You know, we thought that was a foreign mission field. You know, but, and, but boy, they talk funny in Alabama. You know, but, you know, and he, come here and he, and he finds, this, finds this bond of Christians who are serving God and working together. And some of you grew up in Kansas. Trust me, I didn't go across the Kansas state line when I was growing up as a kid. That was... That was a foreign field because of all those Jayhawk fans there. I mean, you know, we had to pray for them daily and uh, fast for them, you know, and stuff like that. But, but we, you know, th there's Christians here too. Believe it or not, there's a few Christians in Missouri. Not many, but there's a few over there, okay? And, and, and we just have this common bond. Why? Because we're doing the work of God, serving Him in obedience, which is what God has called us to do. But there's some also some key implications on the statements made, that Jesus made for the family. Those, those, this statement is big for the church, but it's also big for the family. 
What do you say, and you say, what is he saying to the family here? Now, I've got to be very careful, okay, about what I say here, and I don't want it to be misunderstood. So I'm going to ask you to listen really, really careful to me about the implication for the families. I love the family, okay, and I believe in family. I love being with family at Christmas and holidays and next to God and His will for our lives. Families are the greatest thing and of great importance. Uh, I understand that God created the family before He created the, the church, okay, However, if we are not careful, if we are not careful, our families can keep us from walking wholly and completely with God. Now, let me say that again. If we are not careful, our families can keep us from walking wholly and completely with God. Let me tell you what happened several years ago. I don't know, 50s, 60s, 30s, 40s. I don't know exactly when. I wasn't alive back then, okay? Uh, But I remember as a kid that we would have preachers get up in the pulpit and they'd say, you moms and dads, you need to have your kids in every single church service every single night. By golly, if we have a revival service, they better be here seven nights a week. Church is more important than anything else in this world. More important than your Little League ball games. I'm, in, I'm imitating now here. Okay, I'm not preaching. I'm imitating here. More important than your Little League ball games. More important than your baseball schedule. More important than this. More important than that. And it's just, you better be in church. God's going to get you. Okay. Now listen, that was the preaching for many years. And I grew up under that. And guess where I was every Sunday and Wednesday night and Thursday night and revival meeting nights? I was in church, okay? Uh, some kids wear their baseball uniforms to church. I wasn't allowed to do that. I had to change in the car, okay? If I had a 1 o'clock baseball game, it was get out of church, and we weren't leaving the invitation early. If it had 62 verses, we were staying for every verse of just as I am, okay? I'm just telling you right now. We, we weren't leaving. God was going to kill us, okay? That's what we believed and we were taught, okay? Now, listen, that, was, that wasn't all bad preaching, okay? I'm not getting onto the preaching. I'm just saying that was the mentality, but people got tired of that, and they found out that a lot of preachers found out people didn't like that kind of preaching, so they just started to say, well, in that case, you know, and, and you know what happened in the 60s, 70s especially, and into the 80s, with this huge emphasis on the home and the family. Now listen, I'm not against emphasizing the home and the family, but everything became about the home and the family. And we've got to build our homes and build our families, and I believe in strong homes, and I believe in strong families, okay? And this is where I take a danger of becoming misunderstood. But I think if we are not careful, we can say, well, my family is so important and everything is about our family. And in this family, everything is about the family. If we're not careful, we'll set God on the shelf behind the family to the point where family becomes more important to God. And folks, if that ever happens, we've set up another idol in our life. If the family becomes an idol, then, then it's not in blessing and, and, and it's not going to receive God's blessing. And I think we preach that so many years that, that families need to do things together, and I agree they do. And we've preached so many, so many years that we need strong families, and I'm not saying we don't. But if we're not careful, we will begin to worship the family over the creator of the family. I'm going to get myself off the hook just a little bit here, and I'm going to quote an author because I like the way that he puts it here. Arkant Hughes says this, quote, In a valiant effort to stem the tide... Many Christians and non-Christians alike have made the family everything. Every moment of every day, every involvement, every commitment, every engagement is measured and judged by the question, how will this benefit my family? While this is generally commendable, it can degenerate into a familial narcissism. The four walls of the home become a temple, and only within and for those walls are any sacrifices made. Thus, we commit domestic idolatry. This is an immense tragedy. The tragedy is this. Every earthly loyalty, if it is made central, becomes idolatry. And all idolatries eventually destroy their worshipers. The truth is, many of the psychological problems in our families can be traced to parents whose affections bind rather than release and liberate. Avoiding the permissive destruction which is ravaging our society, some parents perpetrate a possessive destruction which is equally devastating, end quote. See what he's saying there? Since some people have made the family so much of everything that everything circles around them. And by the way, I'll, I'll be the first to say as a pastor, this becomes frustrating, especially when I say, hey, you guys going to be in church today? You guys going to be in church this week? And a lot of people say, well, yeah, if nothing's going on, you know, I'll have to check the schedule because I think we've got this, this, and this, and this. And what happens is the family becomes more important than even the worship of God. Now listen, I'm not sitting here saying this morning, you can be in church every single service or God's going to kill you. I'm not saying that, okay? 
I am saying, though, that if the family, the activities of the family, and if the family's calendar becomes more important than, than the worship of God and the obedience of God, then there's a problem. We've gone too far overboard the other direction. Tim Keller wrote this in his book. He, he writes a story about a later lady named Anna. And he says this. He said, My wife and I knew a single woman named Anna who wanted desperately to have children. Finally, later years in, later in life, she eventually married, and contrary to the expectations of her doctors, she was able to bear two healthy children despite her age. But her dreams did not come true. Her overpowering drive to give her children a perfect life made it impossible for her to actually enjoy them. Her overprotectiveness, fears and anxieties, and her need... Are you kidding me? I didn't copy the rest of that paragraph. Oh, her need to control every detail of her children's lives made the family miserable. Anna's oldest child did poorly in school and showed signs of serious emotional problems. The younger child was filled with anger. There's a good chance her drive to give her children wonderful lives will actually be the thing that ruins them. Getting her heart's deepest desire may end up being the worst thing that ever happened to her. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes we want things so much. He goes on a couple pages later and says, The woman Anna, who was ruining her children's lives, did not love her children too much, but rather loved God too little in relationship to them. As a result, her child gods were crushed under the weight of her expectations. You see, folks, there's nothing wrong with family. I love family. I love hanging out with my family. I love doing things with my family. But if my family becomes the thing that drives me, the thing that I find joy in, it's, it's where I place all my happiness, then I've set up an idol in my life, even over God. And that's part of what Jesus was saying here. Now, I know a lot of stuff that I just talked about could be very much misunderstood. And I hope you'll take it in, 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 in the sense that I presented this morning. You say, what is the answer? You want a home that honors God? And it starts with a husband, a dad who loves God and obeys Him first. That's where it starts. And if there's not a dad in the home or for some reason you're not married, it means a mom who loves God and honors Him and her life above everything else. And it means kids who love God and want to obey Him more so they obey their parents and, and, and they obey Him first and, and obey their parents and, and because anything else, folks, becomes idolatry. A family that is walking in obedience to God is a close-knit family. And when there's disobedience, then the harmony is broken. And, you know, it, it applies in both things. In the church family, when there's obedience to God's will and we're working together and, and there's harmony, I mean, when we're in obedience together, then we're walking in harmony together. When there's disobedience, then, then we're not har- walking in harmony together. The same thing is true in the family. When we love Him first, then we can love our wives, our husbands, our children, parents, as the way that we should. And God will bless those kinds of homes. Let's bow our heads this morning.